here's, here's my perspective is, yeah, you can, if you want to, you're more than welcome to go hit 800 balls a day like Mo did for five years, and you'll end up with a, probably a pretty decent move at a golf ball. Or you can just copy the best in the world, and in a very short period of time, as long as you copy it relatively correctly, you can end up with a golf swing in a lot less period of time. I, I love the game of golf since I was a kid. That's all I wanted to do. I got up at 9 o'clock in the morning to watch the British Open. I skipped school. That's all I did was play golf. Played competitive golf, played in college. Loved the game of golf. Wanted to get better at the game. Started working with the best instructors in the world, and golf became very hard. It was very frustrating, and really got to the point where I just wanted to quit the game. Then I met Mo Norman. I learned the single plane swing, and literally it saved my game. I fell in love with golf again. My mission is to help people learn what I learned, which is an easier way to play and start loving playing golf again. So I'm, I'm about speeding up the process as well, which is why which is why I copied Mo to begin with. I wanted to speed up the process. I wanted to stop the guessing. And to me, the minute we stop guessing and the minute we go to the model and, and, I, and you can look at it and go, hey, this is exactly where Mo is, you're, you're improving like that. That's how fast you can improve. So, so to me, it's all about speeding up the process. And I would always be trying to ask Mo questions about speeding up the process. What's the next thing that's gonna get me there faster? Yeah, that, that's, that's what everybody really wants, awesome. yeah. Um, so Todd, I'm going to go full video mode on you and then maybe you can walk us through a few things that you wanted to cover for yeah. everyone today. Yeah, I'll go through a few things real quick. So one of the things, and I kind of mentioned this a minute ago, when we talk about the golf swing and, and I'll, I'll kind of step you through from a dress position, um, into swing mechanics and I'll, I'll kind of work in order when when I teach the go golf schools or I teach people in kind of a formal setting, I always make sure people learn things in the proper sequence. And the reason I do that is because, um, because everything that you, that you learn relates. And, and I'll get more into that in just a minute. But, but you can't just say, okay, let's talk about lower body move. Because the lower body is going to move relative to how you position the feet and how you position the upper body and things like that. So we have to work in a proper order. The second thing that I think is important to understand is I talk about grip and how you hold a golf club secondary to body position. Now, that's a little counterintuitive to what most people teach. Most people teach grip first. And if you read, if you look at, if you go into Barnes & Noble right now and you go look at all these books, the first thing they start out with is grip. And so I, I, I'm kind of counter to that because the way you place your hands on the club is a direct relationship to club face but it also relates to your arm position. So you must, to me, you have to talk about the position of the body and the hands together. And when you look at Mo, and you look at a single plane swing, and you look at especially Mo's technique, what you see is because of his body position and because of the way his hands are placed on the club, you get this alignment of the lead arm and the club. And then from a down the line view, you get another alignment, see the alignment of the trail arm and the club. Now, these two lines, this alignment here and this alignment here, are a function of my tilt of my body, the rotation of my arm, and the rotation of my trail arm. So you can notice that the grip, body position, and arm position are all very related to get into this, what we call ideal single plane address position where the club is lined up with the lead arm. See that alignment there? And then from a down the line view, the club is lined up with the trail arm. Now you'll notice from that down the line view that this arm is visible above that arm and it's not visible. And, and this is where when you start instructing people and you're trying to get some clarity on why you're seeing this, it's not because my arms are lifted higher because that's what everybody tends to see. They see, oh, Mo's hands are higher. If you actually had Mo today, and this is one of the questions I asked him was like, Mo, how do you feel it addressed? He felt like his hands were underneath him. Well, that's kind of counterintuitive to people thinking, well, my hands are lifted up high. And it's because when he's side bend, this is called side bend, that's tilt, side bend. Notice how my arm comes up. This, this lead shoulder goes higher. All right, well, that arm goes higher, but it actually brings this arm lower. And those two things create a single plane alignment with that club. So now you got the lead arm lined up and you got the trail arm lined up. So 
what you're going to see, and the reason that I kind of focus on the model, which I mentioned earlier, is because the, the hand position, this hand being in this rotation, which I'll talk about in a minute, this hand being in this rotation, the, the bend of the body, side bend, it's everything's related. It's all related to uh, the address position and the grip, and you can't, you can't single out one thing and say, well, Mo was a great ball striker because of his grip. You, you have to look at all the metrics together. So having said that, let's kind of walk you through, and I'm gonna do this without a golf club for just a second. When I put my body in that position, so here's, what I'm, here's what's actually occurring, and I try, to back, I try to back up everything I teach with a little bit of biomechanics. In other words, you know, I don't want people to get too confused by what does biomechanics really mean, but, but it's just, I wanna back things up with, with some, some, some realistic things that, you go, that make you in your head go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So what, when you go like this with your body, so if, you, if I take you and I, and I put you in a side bend, just like Mo Norman, which is about 15 degrees of side bend, and I isolate, and what I'm gonna, I'll talk about in a second, if I isolate this arm, and the way I do that, I just wanna grab my, grab my upper arm and not let it move, you'll notice that I can only move my hand so far. So you're gonna see that because of side bend, because of shoulder and upper arm isolation, I only have so much range of motion of a lead arm. And let me ask you this question. The most important moment of a golf swing is when you get to this moment of impact, right? We all want to get to this impact where the face is square, the hands are leading, and we're able to produce speed on a golf club. If we can get there consistently, we can hit a golf ball consistently. Well, I want to help you get, get to the impact position, but I don't want you, I want to create limitations of movement. And, I'll, and, and, and this is where maybe what I teach is different than what a lot of people teach. How do you create a limitation of, a, of the body? In other words, if I said to you, I'm gonna mistake-proof your movement. In other words, you can swing as hard as you want, you just can't go to the wrong position. Well, here's how I do that. By giving you a side bend of the body, right? It isolates the shoulder because of the bend. You can only, you can only move the shoulder so far. It's isolating the lead hand position. So now, as long as you're side bent, and you turn, you can only go to that spot, right? Now, I'll give you some other examples. My, my lead, we teach the lead knee being slightly flexed. We want the foot to be rotated and the knee to be flexed. I want this foot on the ground. Watch what happens. So now, if I'm side bent and I, and I rotate, the back of the hand goes to the target. Remember, that's your club face. And now, I can only go so far with my lower body. So now, what I have is, I am basically only able to go to this position at impact. And I can swing as much as I want, and as long as I'm side bent, my foot's down and my, and my knee's flexed, I am hitting a position, the only position that my body can go to. This is the foundation of what Mo Norman did, because by, by positioning his body, knee flex, foot down, side bend, upper, upper hand position, there's one final thing that he did, which is really interesting, is when you do this and you go into side bend, notice what this hand does. It goes into a non-rotational position. This would be similar to hammering a nail or whatnot. So now what you're getting is you're getting it this, the easiest motion that the body can produce and you're creating limitations in it so it can only go to those positions. Now you add speed to that. And now, so what happens now I'm gonna add speed to a golf club and so I put my body in those positions. There's my lead arm position, my side bent, my trail hand position. And now when I swing, as long as I hit, as long as my body stays in those positions, it, the club has to square up because it's the, it's the only place that the body can go. So you just saw me walk you through the golf swing by creating limitations in the body. And so that's really, where the, that's really where the success of Mo came from because I asked Mo this question. I said, I said, Mo, how do you be, become so consistent? And his only answer ever to me was, hit your positions. So I had to go, what are the positions that you have to hit? Well, the address position, because that's, that, and when I say address, that includes foot position, leg position, upper body position, arm position, all the things I just mentioned. And then the position of the body's bend, side bend rotation, the position of the body, bent knee, foot down, 
side bent body, and then the position of the finish. And if you're able to hit your positions, which mean all the positions of the body, the club can only go into one path. And that's really, I mean, I could go into lots of detail, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has, but that's really the foundation of why, if you asked a simple question and said, well, why was Mo such a great ball striker? Is because he couldn't make a mistake because of the way he was positioning his body. It created limitations in what was possible. In other words, his club could only go to a square position because of the way his hands and body placed were on the golf club. He, his foot position, because of the knee flex, the foot down, his lower body could only go so far. So to me, how you move is just as important as the position of your body to restrict movement. You have to look at both sides of that <laughs> equation. It's not about, you know, so often people say, well, rotate more. No, that's not the answer. Rotate the correct amount with the body in the correct position. So there's a lot of things I'd be happy to answer if people have some questions about. Yeah, no, real quick before, like, um, that was kind of mind-blowing, <laughs> to be honest with you. Like, I, I never heard anyone put it in that perspective with the, uh, with the limitations, but it's so practical and makes so much sense, what you just said. And it's, and it's funny because everything that you hear i guess if you want to call it traditional golf is more about like how open can you get at uh at impact and all these things and 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 it's all been like you know all these players have different um different degrees that they're open tilted all this stuff but it, it it's it's always usually about like how much more hip depth can you get? How much more uh, open can you get an impact to reduce club face rotation, et cetera? And you never heard anyone just explain that. Like, we want to limit limit some of your movements so you can just be consistent and efficient. Well, watch this for just a second, because because one of the things that was so important for me in my learning process was to was to spend time with guys that are much smarter than me in the understanding of how the body actually works. And if you, you know, guys like Greg Rose with TPI and, and these guys that really are into the biomechanics of the swing, which by the way, I knew nothing about five years ago. I mean, I was literally just was teaching Mo's swing and saying, hey, this is the best way to do it. And now I know why Mo's swing was so efficient and so good. But one of the things they explained to me, and I think it was a great explanation that I needed to hear, if you actually look at a good golf swing, you, you, what, you, what, what, a, what a biomechanics, a person who understands the kinematic sequence of a swing will show you is, is the swing's kinematic sequence. Have you ever seen a kinematic sequence before? Yeah. Yeah. So, so most coaches and people have seen these kinematic sequences, which are just graphs that basically are mapping body movement and the speed of the body parts. Well, what's interesting about a kinematic sequence chart, which we don't, it's, it's detailed and it's fun to look at, and I, and I love looking at this stuff. But what's so fascinating about a sequence chart is you seeing movement, but what you need, what, what you really are focusing on is how body, the body is producing speed. So we all want to make sure that when we hit a golf ball, that when we get to a certain point, we can accelerate the golf club through impact and make sure it's square at the moment of impact. So it's really about what's happening in this area through here. So the next question that you have when you're understanding biomechanics is, how is that happening? Like, like this is, a, this is a question you sit in a room with biomechanics guys and go, okay, you just produced a lot of speed in your arms. How did that just happen? And it's an interesting question because you get to the point where it's like, okay, the arms are moving, but they had to move around something. Like they, they're just not, you can't have arms just freely moving. So what, what, you come, what you end up in the conclusion is, look, you've got to stop this to let this, to allow this to move. You have to stop that to allow that to move. And you bet, matter of fact, you have to slow the arms down to let the hands move. So you start focusing on what's stopping. You start focusing on what, what's allowing the next part to accelerate. So if I had to give you an analogy, it would be a horse race. And the horse race would look like this. There would be, so let's just look at the golf swing for a second in the sequence of events. You have the lower body moves first, right? There's that stabilization of the lower body. And then you have the body turning. And then you get to a point where, in, in conventional golf, they post up. You see this a lot. 
in our swing, you, you hit into a flex knee, which is safer. We like that better. But then you've got the upper body turning. But then look, look, look what happens to my body about right here. If I'm side bent, and, and people can stand up out of their chair and try this, you can't really turn more than that. I'm talking torso here. The only thing left to move from this point is the arms and the shoulders can start moving past the body. So in other words, you get, here's what happens. You get lower body movement, torso movement, arms and shoulder movement, and then you have the completion of the sequence of events. So what allowed that to occur, where did that start? Well, it started right here. It started when the lower body stopped here and said, you know what, Todd? I'm only going to let you go this far. I'm not letting you go anymore. The only thing that you can move now is the right side of your body. Okay, the right side of my body. Okay, now what, what's next? Well, I can't move the right side of my body anymore, so what can go? Oh, the arms can go. And all of a sudden now, you have a perfect sequence golf swing, and it's because of what stopped, not because of moving more. And that's really the biomechanical side of that horse race, of the horse race of lower body, upper body, arms, hands, and club. It's that horse race that's happening from the top of the swing. And the question that, that I always had for these biomechanics guys was, was this, it's like, how is the upper body using the lower body? Like how is the torso able to, to now rotate with the lower body stopping? And then when I get to this point here, how do the arms accelerate if the upper body is stopping? And they're using the next body part. So the horses, they're in the horse race, and the torso, the pelvis takes off first. So here's the, the pelvis goes first, then the torso, then the, the arms, and then the hands. So you have this four, this sequence of events. But the torso, the, the, the pelvis is out first, the torso second, arms are third, hands are fourth. Well, here's what happens. This pelvis, it goes first. And then the torso goes, you know what? I'm going to grab onto that pelvis right here, and I'm going to use it to move. And so what it does is it grabs onto that pelvis, and then the arms go, you know what? I'm going to grab onto that torso. And so each additional body part is grabbing the next one and using it. But here's, here's my point to this. If it's not stable, if I, for example, turn my pelvis and I don't stabilize it, the torso has nothing to work against. So then it says, you know what, Todd? Um, I, can't, I can't move. I can't accelerate. Well, guess what? The arms are going to use the torso, and the torso is like, I'm not stable. Can't use me. And then people cast early, and they release the club, and then all of a sudden they lose all the speed. So people who want to produce more speed, which might be the conversation that we have about Bryson, it's really not about moving more. It's really about moving more efficiently. Stopping this in the correct way, moving this, stopping this in the correct way, and then moving that. So it's that sequence of events that people have to get better at, which is the biomechanics of the swing. But I mean, I'm, in, a, in, a, in a way, I've kind of explained that without trying to get in too much detail. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. If you, if you want, um, Todd, what we can do is I did get a few questions. Maybe we can answer those here because yep. uh, they're all s swing related. Sure. Um, so Jay asks, did uh, Mo grip in the palms or the fingers? It was difficult to tell from the videos I've seen. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I get that question all the time. And, and here's the thing about it. it. It was in the fingers, but pay attention more to um, hand rotation. And, and I, if I would have thought about it, I would have brought, brought, Mo gave me a bunch of his clubs so you can see his grip size. Pay more attention to um, the rotation of the body position more than is it in the palm or is it in the fingers. So let me just kind of do a quick demonstration because I, I want to explain this a little bit. Um, if you look at Mo's address, I'm going to grab the shaft of the club. Uh, yeah, I'll just grab the shaft of the club. And you can see that I'm actually holding the shaft. I'm not even holding the grip. So this is the thinnest part of the club. And I can easily hold that just like Mo Norman did. That club is aligned exactly where Mo's club was, aligned with my trail arm, and it's exactly lined up with my lead arm. So there's no reason that I can't properly align a golf club with my arms and my hands holding the shaft. Now, I'm going to take my hands off the club for a second, and you're going to notice that that shaft is running through this part of my hand. So I'll come closer to the camera so you can see that. So look where it's running through my hand. That would be considered more towards the fingers of the hand. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this grip into my hand, and you're going to see it start filling up my hand, and you're going to say now, well, that might be a little more towards the palm of the hand. 
and then I'll come up to the top of the club, and you're going, okay, now it's more towards the palm. So to me, the important part is that the shaft is going through the proper part of the hand, and the, the palm idea is always based on grip size. If you look at Bryson, for example, massive grips on his club, right? And yeah, they're going to go right up into the palm of the hand. They're huge grips. They'll fit right up into the palm of the hand. But so, of course, it's like if I was holding a water bottle, that thing would fill up my entire hand. But the shaft line is still going through that part of the hand. Which you, here's where you run into a problem. If the shaft line runs too high into the hand. And this, is, this would be the shaft running through the palm. Now i got a big problem. Here's why. Because now I cannot leverage this golf club. I can't produce an angle. And it's because this shaft has to be under, this is the radius bone of your arm. It has to be under that radius bone to produce a leverage angle. See what happened there? And, and so there's a lot kind of to this. And people get way too caught up in palm versus uh, not palm. I am not a big grip in the palm guy because it bases on grip size. What I want to see people do is get the proper hand rotation. So that means body position, hand rotation, the club being under the radius bone, and then look at this hand. Notice how when I tilt, this hand goes into a rotation. This hand is now under the club. Now, I'll do this again with you. Watch where this club is placed, even though, it, see how it's lined up with my trail arm perfectly into a single plane alignment? However, my palm isn't anywhere near the golf club. It's actually running through the fingers, but it's the rotation of the hand that keeps it lined up with the arm. Right. So be very careful on this whole palm idea because what people are doing is they're getting very thin grips, normal grips, trying to grip these in the palm, reducing leverage, and everybody runs around saying, I'm hitting it so short, there's no reason you should lose speed, but if you start going palm, palm with a thin grip, the shaft, the shaft plane gets out of alignment with the arm. It's, you know, it's biomechanics, but you're gonna run into some problems. But good question, I, mean, I get that a lot. Chris asked, is the speed and the downswing created late? Well, it, any kinematic sequence shows you that yes, all speed is, well, late being, see, late is a term, uh, late is a sequencing term, right? If I say late when, in, late in the sequence. So if you, let's just look at it because, because what's happening is the speed of the pelvis starts first. So you're going to see the pelvis move first. Then you're going to see the torso move second. And then you're going to see the arms moving down. And then the final speed, the late speed is the hands, the arms and shoulders delivering the club. So the hands, arms, and shoulders delivering the club. So yes, it's, a, it's, it's late relative to the pelvis. It's late relative to the torso. So that's a timing question. The answer is absolutely. Um, that's a very easy thing to see, both on video and if you're doing any biomechanics work. But the, so I guess the, maybe the, the answer to that is, let's look at the feeling of that. And I always realize, relate it to this. It's like once your lower body is stable, that means you moved into that lead side. And I, I can turn as much as I want, and then I'm, I'm going to release the arms. So what you're getting there is a release of the arms, what I would say, in the latest moment possible. So that, yes, the answer is yes. It is a late feeling of the arms and hands delivering the club at the last part of that sequence. Awesome. Uh, Randy asked uh, to comment on grip pressure. He said the single plane works for him when he has a relaxed grip. It doesn't work when I grip too tight. So, so grip pressure, and, and, and here's what I always mention to people about the grip, is that your hands cannot do anything to a golf club except hold on to it. So if you look at, if I'm holding a golf club, the hands by themselves cannot move a golf club. And so I mean, the only way I can move a golf club is to let go of the club, right? But as long as my hands are holding the club, they have no function and movement at all. So they're literally just clamps. Now, how does that, when you talk about grip pressure, what does that mean? Well, if you add pressure to these clamps, you're actually adding pressure to the wrists. So the wrists are now locked and that's what keeps people from having a, 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 and so, well, what happens is, and it's exactly what I talked about a few minutes ago, is when you freeze the wrists, you're actually freezing the arms, which affects how the shoulders, so basically, when you add pressure, it's not about the hand pressure that's really the problem, it's really about how much tension get put into the arms and shoulders, and now you're not freeing up the movement. When you let those hands have a little more, less pressure, now, see how my, my arm can bend, 
which it couldn't do when the wrists were locked, and now the arm can straighten. So now you can use the arms and hands and wrists correctly, and the hands, because you reduce the pressure, allow the arms and wrists to work. And that's really what I think the question is. It's, right. it's yeah, you can add too much pressure, but it's not the hand pressure that's the problem. It's the way it's restricting the movement of the arms and the wrists. So I, I'm not saying I'm a light pressure guy. I think you've got to hold it pretty good with the lead hand, but I'm a very light wrist, right wrist pressure because I always relate it to this. If you're going to skip a rock, you, don't, you hold the rock in the end of the hand, right? So the, the rock's here. And, you're, and, and by the way, you're tilted, and now you're going to skip a rock, and it's a, it's a non-rotational skip, but you can't, you can't grab the rock with, with all your pressure and expect it because it's too much pressure and you're not going to be able to use the wrist. So think about skipping rocks. When you're holding a golf club, just enough pressure to, to skip the rock or, or skip the golf club, and that's going to allow the wrist to work correctly. Great. So think about wrist pressure, not necessarily hand pressure. That makes sense. Uh, Lee asked, did, did Mo Norman hit fades and draws or only straight shots? Yes. Yeah, I got that question a lot. So I played, I was going to tell you this quick story. I, the, one of the last rounds I played with Mo, we, we used to play in Titusville all the time at a, cl a club called Royal Oak. And the, you know, the, it's pretty, not a hard golf course, but you know, it's kind of fun. And one day I'm playing with Mo and he keeps hitting it like he hit one straight right into the right trees. Then he hit it on the green and then the next hole was left and he was hitting it not down the middle of the fairway. And I, I'm about six holes into it and I said, hey Mo, you know, what's going on? He goes, I found all the shortcuts. And so what he was doing was he had played the course and, and he could find shorter angles and he would literally hit it in the rough on purpose because he could hit it between the trees. He was hitting eight iron where I was hitting five iron and things like that because I was hitting it down the fairway having long shots into the greens. Mo hit it, generally 90% of the time, he hit it straight. If at any time I asked him to fade it and draw it, he could fade it and draw it. Now, I want to talk about shaping golf shots. And, and I play a lot of golf now, by the way. I play a lot of golf. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say this with, because um, you can check out my YouTube channel. I play, I play rounds of golf on my YouTube channel. The only time I allow a golf ball to shape is when I'm, I'm letting the wind help it shape. So in other words, I never try to force a shape of a golf ball around a tree. I mean, okay, so maybe I hit it in the trees and I gotta hit a hook, but even that, trust me, those are when I'm usually in trouble and I usually end up hooking it back into the trees and I, I hit a bad shot. So 99% of the shots that I play are a straight shot. If they move any direction, it's because I let the wind do it. And I, I recommend, and this is just my recommend as a coach, is stop worrying so much about hitting draws and fades and absolutely learn to hit a golf ball straight. Because once you learn to hit a golf ball straight, then 90% of the shots you're gonna hit for the rest of your life are gonna be straight at targets. And then the one, the 10% the that you wanna curve it aren't gonna even matter because half the time you wanna curve it, it it's because you're in trouble anyway. So I always tell people, look, I, I want you to hit a straight pattern at a golf shot. I want you to build a straight pattern and then let the wind move it if it needs to. But your best golf will be played when you can predict a straight shot. The, the people who are out there curving balls one direction or the other, the reason you're curving a golf ball is because you don't know how to hit it straight. And so you're trying to predict its pattern. And so a guy who's trying to hit a draw is just like, at least I know what's going that way. <laughs> and a guy who isn't a fade, at least I know what's going over there. So it's all about our goal as to become better golfers is to develop a predictable pattern. And so I'm always working with students build a straight pattern the game gets so much easier than trying to predict a left pattern or a right pattern. gotcha thomas asks uh if you make any adjustments to the swing for a pitching wedge versus a driver uh to the swing no the, me the mechanics of the swing are exactly the same but obviously you know a pitching wedge obviously it's a much shorter golf club and so you, the um so you don't have as much centripetal force because the club's closer to the body because it's a wedge. So the only difference would be stance width. Um, and by the way, let's look at something real quick. This would be kind of interesting. Uh, this is a, this tool right here, by the way, is one of our basic training tools. It's our alignment trainer. It has, it tells you where your uh, ball position should be, your foot position for each club in your bag. So this is just a little training tool that we, we train with. Nice. I'm going to put the ball, I'm going to put the ball position right here for iron ball position. And that's right here. And look at this for a second. So here's my lead foot position. And that ball position with the wedge is five inches inside my lead foot. So my lead heel is five inches. Okay, keep that in mind. 
Now, this is a, a pitching wedge, and if you look at me with a pitching wedge, you're going to look at, well, that ball is about the middle of your stance, right? It's about the middle. Now, when I go to hit, I'll, go, I'll grab a, I'll grab a uh, let's grab a four iron. I'm going to leave the ball position where it's at, so I'm not changing ball position. I'm going to leave my lead foot where it's at, but I'm going to move my, four, my foot wider for a four iron. Now, you're going to see that ball position looks much more forward. Here's a wedge. Looks like it's the middle. And here's a, a four iron, okay? The ball position didn't change. So this is, this is what's important. But it actually did change. Because if I go to hit a wedge, I want you to watch my lead shoulder. So here's my wedge. Now watch my four iron. See my lead shoulder? What happened to my lead shoulder? Yeah. It, goes, it, back. it goes back that way, right? Yeah. So effectively, even though the ball is not moving relative to my foot, it's moving relative to the shaft angle. See that? Right. So, so people always say, well, you know, Mo would say, I don't move the ball position. Well, he didn't move the ball position, but he adjusted the trail foot based on the club he was hitting. So this wedge, watch what happens now. Because of the ball positions here, look at how much shaft lean I have in that wedge. Okay, let's call that 10 degrees, right? I don't know what that is. Let's call that 10 degrees, right? Right. That impact. Let me grab my four iron again. Now, wider stance. Look what happens now at impact. You have less than 10 degrees because you're more behind the golf ball, and the club now launches at a higher angle. And of course, a four iron, you can't have 10 degrees de-lofted on a four iron. So basically, Mo figured out that just by a slight adjustment of his trail foot, he could adjust it for each club. So the answer to the question is, yeah, I'm adjusting my trail foot position based on the club that I'm hitting, but I'm leaving the ball position in the same place. Gotcha, awesome. Uh, we got a few more here. If you're if you're good with that, Todd. Yeah. Uh, Pierre asks, um, do you know why this swing is not um, is used as much on tour besides uh, Bryson? I, I really don't have. I've never had a good answer for that question, other than the way golf golf is taught now. It's you know there's this thing out there. It, I almost I read a lot of golf instruction articles and they throw a term around, which I still don't think that this term is the right term, but they call it the athletic position at address, right? It's like the athletic position. Well, what is that? Well, if you ask any conventional golf instructor, he's going to show you, well, the athletic position is you bend your knees a little bit, you, you get stable, and you hang your arms straight down. And so they're going to show you this athletic position. However, you look at anybody at impact, and they're nowhere near that athletic position. And the reason I bring this up is because this whole idea of hanging the arms straight below the shoulders is where 99% of golf is being taught. But, but we don't impact a golf ball with our arms below our shoulders. We impact a golf ball with our arms lining up with the club shaft. So it's the way golf is taught. It's taught from a, it, it's taught from a two plane position. And then there's all these varieties of solutions for a two plane position. And I'll give you a, a, what I mean by solution is if you look at uh, Lee Westwood, for example, his both feet are off the ground going into impact. Um, everybody is trying to solve a problem, and I call it the one mistake. The one mistake is if you start in an athletic position, which I don't think is athletic, but let's just call it that. If you start with the arms hanging down, you got a problem because when you move a golf club, it's, the, the force of the club is moving away from you. It's going to try to line up with the arms. So we have to come up with a solution for that. Well, Mo figured it out. I mean. He figured out that all you got to do really is make sure the club is lined up with the arms to begin with, and then you no longer have the problem. That's why he was such a great ball striker. And the guys who tend to find this solution, uh, Sergio Garcia, and guys who are a little more like this, Steve Stricker and now Bryson, you got they're 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 going to have a better chance of getting to the impact position. So you're starting to see guys out there that are getting closer to this. And my my contention is always. The guys who are the closest to being on the impact plane to start are always going to be the better ball strikers because they got a lot less movement of the shaft going into impact. But, I mean, I don't know a good answer to why more guys aren't doing it other than it's just the way golf is taught. Mm -hmm. It's taught to hang the arm straight down. And, and, and the other thing, too, I could mention is that I've played competitive golf. I've been on plenty of tours. I've, I've done so much in the game of golf. Ball striking is an important part. I love it. I mean, it's, it's, I focus on it. It's part, it's, it's, it's what I do. I love teaching people. I love watching people improve their ball striking. 
but it's only a piece of the game. The guys who went out there on tour are good ball strikers, but they're chipping and putting remarkably well. I mean, if you got to focus on the people putting yeah. well. Um, so there's so many elements to the game that ball striking is just a piece of the puzzle. And so we can focus. I love the golf swing. I want everybody to hit it solid and straight. But at the end of the day, you got to make putts. As I know, I played a money game the other day, and I three-putted the ninth green and lost all the money on the last <laughs> hole because I three-putted. So, so you can lose your money from putting. And I hit it really good, too, by the way. Yeah, no, that, so. that, that's a good point, though, because the, vac, the, I, the, the shaft does go more vertical at impact. I've seen – People talk about that a lot, about how the this, this shaft does go more vertical, uh, to your point. Yeah. So if, if you're starting here, you're going you're gonna to see guys that are impacting on a higher plane. Right. So they're, they're having to an upward movement of the body. Well, there's a lot that goes on to, make, to get the club to do that. Now, look, there's a lot of good ball strikers out there. I've played with plenty of them, and, and guys can learn to hit it well, but, and that's just a piece of it. It's, it this is a much easier motion. Mo figured out that if he, if he put the club, now keep in mind that I'm tilted because we talked about that, but if I put the body in the correct position, that this straight line right here going into a golf ball is much e easier than starting here and figuring out a way to get that to occur. So, so Mo just figured out a more direct path to hitting a golf ball, and that's why I, mean, that's why I, I, had, I was attracted to it because I saw – an incredibly efficient way to hit a golf ball. Uh, Dave was wondering uh, if there's uh, how much torque is on the front leg. Well, I, I don't know if I can quantify torque. Um, I don't know if anybody quantifies torque, but um, torque would torque is is force in rotation, and th there is a lot more torque in a conventional swing than what we teach, and I'll tell you why because. I, I, I always recommend that people have a rotated foot to start with at least 30 degrees because what happens is now the lead, see the lead knee can, can flex towards the foot right. and now there's very little torque on the lead leg. But here's, here's, here's a danger zone that I think people have to be careful of. And look, when I see this, when I, when I coach, I'm like, oh crap, when I see this. When I see people with a straight foot on the lead foot, now we have a problem because now we're asking for pelvis rotation, but now we got a knee that's out of position to rotate. So now you have torque. So if you want to get torque off the lead foot, you've got to rotate it this way so that the knee can, it's already in a rotated position. It's, it's, it's opening, it, it opening itself up. So now it's less torque. So there's very little torque in what I teach, but I know if, if you have your foot straight, you're going to feel torque, which I wouldn't recommend. Okay. Uh Steve was asking uh, in, in your book he, that you described the first thought of the downswing should be the front knee shift to the toes. Can you explain when this, <clears throat> when this move should occur in, in the sequence? Yeah, no, I love that question. Um, so in my book, I, I, I'm going to, if I could put an amendment in that book, here's what I would do, <laughs> because th th this was, in, in th it's actually the first thing that happens is yes, from the top of the swing, the knee goes towards the toe. But I want to ask that same biomechanical question is how the heck is that happening, right? I mean, I always ask that question because it's the how that it's happening that's important, not that it is happening. We can watch, we can watch all types of things go on in the swing, but I want to know why it's occurring. And I want to go, I want to take a step back and look at the backswing for a second, because when I go to the top of my backswing, you'll notice that I'm working against the inside of my leg and the inside of my trail foot. Right. Now, the reason I bring that up is because when I, I, I can easily move my pelvis over into that knee. See that? And that's what I talk about in the book is that you want to see the knee go towards that lead toe. Right. It's like you're stepping into a shoe. But I can't step into a shoe if I don't push off of my trail leg. So, so I want people to spend, you know, this is, my, this is part of my coaching is, I want you to pay as much attention to what happens in the backswing as you do in that first movement into that knee because if you are out of position in the backswing, let's say you shift over, I am not in a position to move into that knee. Does that make sense? Right. So, so to me, the backswing position, this is why Mo said hit your position here because then now it's so easy to move that transition into that lead knee. That's me moving my pelvis into that knee. That's a lot easier. Well, and, and by the way, if you get shifted like this, you can't do it. So that makes that movement easy. And, and whoever is asking that question, if you're having trouble with your transition, look at your backswing position first before you start trying to get over into that knee because 
most likely it's a backswing issue, not a downswing issue. Awesome.